Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Joshua from the University of Bristol, and the work that I've been doing in my PhD focuses on the use of timber concrete composite floors. So what is a timber concrete composite? It's very similar in principle to a steel concrete composite floor. We've got a concrete slab that overlays a series of wooden timber joists, and they are connected together by shear connectors. Now, the shear connectors that you use in this connection could be inclined screws, vertical screws, bolts, plates, or even glue or connection of all of the above. So there's uh, many, many different methods of connecting that have been used so far in experimentation. There is a small but growing use of timber concrete composites around the world as they grow in a reputation. So a couple of them on the screen here. To the top left is the life cycle tower in Austria. This is a building that was conceived to be constructed as fast as possible using prefabricated timber concrete composite floors as you see in the top middle here. And using this method along with prefabricated CLT walls, they managed to build the superstructure at a rate of one story per day. Um, the top right image is the UBC Earth Sciences Building in Vancouver where they uh, built their new Earth Sciences Building out of timber concrete with a cantilever staircase. And the bottom right images show the Dr. Chowchak Wing Building in Sydney, which uh, features timber concrete composite floors as part of the oval classroom, which feature the longest TCC spans to date of over 10 metres. The advantages of TCC floors can be split into two groups, which is one, comparing them to timber, and two, comparing them to all concrete floors. So compared to timber, the addition of the concrete slab above improves the acoustic and vibration performance of the floor compared to only timber, which means this is much more applicable for use in multi-storey residential and commercial buildings than all wooden floors. The concrete itself also provides better fire insulation than a timber floor, although you must be aware that the fact that the timber joist is obviously hanging down below the ceiling, and therefore that will still be subject to fire, but timber is good in, in the fact that uh, the timber will char and therefore the reduced cross-section of the beam will still be able to withstand load. Compared to an all-concrete floor, they have the potential to be lighter because you're replacing a, uh, a more dense material with a less dense material and then you can save on cheaper foundations. The, also, uh, there is reduced cement consumption in the use of these floors as well. The only issue that has not been considered in terms of the lower cement consumption and environmental sustainability is the end of life recyclability of the floors uh, where you'd have to separate the two materials back out into their cons constituent parts in order to recycle them at the end of their design life. The floors themselves are also easily prefabricated as we saw uh, for the uh, life cycle tower building. And they do have uh, the potential to be quite cost effective in relation to timber and to concrete floors. The real drawback so far in their use has been the cost of the connector, which has always proved to be too high. So that's part of what I've focused on in my work. So a bit about the theory that we've heard a bit about before. When you have a fully composite beam, you have very small deflection and no slip at the ends. And you can see the through depth strain profile looks like it does here with the red line. It's continuous through the depth of the beam. When you have no composite action, you then get large slip and large deflections and the strain profile becomes discontinuous with a slip strain at the interface between the timber and the concrete. This assumption here uh, assumes that there's compatibility of curvature, which means that the curvature of the concrete slab and of the timber joist always remain the same, and therefore that is how you can uh, make the assumption as to the three-depth strain. So when you have a partial composite action, you have less deflection, and you have a smaller slip, and also the slip strain is reduced. So it, it relies really on the, sh uh, the slip and the resistance of slip that the shear connectors between the timber and the concrete provide. And it does exploit these complementary properties of the two materials. Concrete is very good in compression and timber is good in tension. And so you will ideally have the concrete fully in tension and the 
the compression, the timber fully in tension. In reality, they are mostly compressive and mo the joists mostly tensile. The ductility provided by a timber concrete composite is very important in its design. The, uh, it provides a warning of failure uh, through its ability to deflect and deform plastically before ultimate failure. And it also can be used to dissipate energy in earthquakes. The two material components themselves are both brittle, timber, and com uh, concrete in failure. So we rely on the connections themselves to provide this ductility. So about my project and what I'm doing, um, most of the prior research into timber concrete composites focuses either on the connections themselves or on single T sections, which is just a single uh, concrete slab with one joist underneath it. And what I am looking at is how we can use the full-scale timber concrete composite floors uh, to transfer, to exploit the transfer of load across these floors to make a more efficient design. I'm making sure I'm using sufficient instrumentation to be able to back calculate not only the load sharing but also the bending moment sharing between these multiple T sections in the floor. And I'm also taking what I've learned from back, uh, literature research into the use of connectors to use what I believe to be the most uh, acceptable connector in a timber concrete composite. So we've seen in our talk on um, steel concrete composite connections the idea of a push-out test. So I have done some on the chosen connector, which is a steel mesh plate, which you can see in outline on the left-hand diagram here. The timber I'm using is a, an LVL, uh, which is laminated veneer lumber. It's like glue lamb, but the laminations themselves are only about four millimeters thick. And I'm also including an interlayer between the timber and the concrete, which is reflective of the uh, permanent formwork that would be in place when you're casting a full concrete floor. The results of the test are shown here. This is per connector, so uh, per each side of that double shear test we can see here. And it shows that at the very, very low range, we've got some um, very high stiffness. So the amount of slip you get up to 100 kilonewtons is very small. The slip stiffness, which uh, is the term used in uh, timber concrete composites and timber design of the connectors, is about 300 uh, kilonewtons per millimeter. After the yield of the connectors, we then get this lovely ductility plateau where the slip increases from about one to over 10 millimeters. Uh, this is just the extent of the range of my, my uh, instrumentation. And this is the bit that provides the ductility. So after the connectors have yielded, you get this ductility and therefore the warning signs of failure. Comparing this to other connectors that have been used, um, here is uh, a, the uh, expected results of an inclined bolt connection and of a timber dowel. So compared to these two other connectors, you can see that one, they are a lot stiffer, and two, provide just as much ductility as some of the other connectors do. This uh, on the left is a picture of the steel plates before they were tested, and on the right afterwards, you can clearly see the deformation in the plate before they eventually became disconnected from one another. And now this is my main full-scale specimen. This is what I've been doing in the lab. It's a three-joist full-scale specimen, which is uh, just over two meters wide and 4.9 meters long. Um, the dimensions of it, which are here. The actual span length is 4.8 meters, and it includes the uh, LVL joist with an interlayer in between and an 80 millimeter concrete slab on top. And these connectors uh, spaced at 150 millimeter intervals and they're 400 mil long. The instrumentation that I've used to uh, acquire the output from this testing is quite a lot. So we've got six load cells, one under each of the supports. We've got uh, displacement measurement, uh, three on each joist at quarter spans. We've got potentiometers to measure the slip the relative slip between the timber joist and the interlayer and the concrete slab, uh, five per joist, and also strain gauges uh, to measure the through depth strains at quarter and mid span. 
So moving on to some of the results that I've got so far. These results um, come from a series of low load tests that I've been doing to uh, indicate the ability of the, uh, of the structure to transfer loads uh, transversely across the slab. The support reaction is shown for each uh, point at which it's loaded, so it's color coded. The, um, for the joists that are loaded off center, so the blue and the red, they, the joist that was loaded received approximately 80% of the load, the middle joist 40, and then the opposite joist negative 20, which indicates an uplift load on one side of the slab. The test that was loaded centrally um, withstood uh, 44, the, the centre joist took 44% of the load and either side 28. So it, it actually shows quite good redistribution transversely through the concrete slab, which shows quite good stiffness. Now, in order to compare the um, transverse load sharing with the transverse bending moment sharing, we need to work backwards, hence the through depth strain diagram here, which you can use to then calculate using the strain in each layer of the timber. So if we divide the uh, section into lots of small layers, calculate the strain at each of these layers, and you can then turn it into a stress and turn it into a moment. The reason you can't just sum the area or integrate the area of the strain diagram is through the use of the different materials um, giving uh, different uh, elastic moduli. This can then be used to get a, a value of the bending moment for the entire section and colleagues at Bristol have also used this technique to map out entire 3D curves of the failure planes of uh, timber concrete composites. So when we compare the load sharing with the bending moment sharing this is what we find. So when it's loaded at the centre the actual difference between the bending moment share and the load share at each joist is quite small, less than 5%. Although when you load at the uh, joists, joists at the extremities, you get up to 35% difference in the bending moment and the load. Now this is uh, a bending moment greater, 35% greater than that of the load sharing, which is quite important because it is for uh, bending moments uh, to which you design uh, most floors and not support reactions. So looking at the deflection of the floors, we've got, um, again, quite symmetric behaviour, which is quite positive, um, and under a load of 20 kilonewtons, the, uh, the maximum deflection for the outside loaded joists is about 3.5 millimetres, and a, a more constant sort of 1.5 to 2 millimetres uh, from loading on the centre joist. And again, we can see the symmetry of the uh, exterior loading um, from looking at looking at the side as well. Now, the, I was also able to measure the transverse strain in the concrete during these small tests. Um, quite uh, as would be expected, under the loaded joist, there is a highly, uh, highly compressive strain, and as you move outwards, they uh, decrease and even become tensile. And it is the, the value of those is less when you are loading the external joists, but you can notice that the, the, the magnitude of the tensile strain in the adjacent joist is much higher. Now, this will be um, in direct conflict with the longitudinal compressive strain, so there will be an interaction between the two there. And here we have the transverse strain for the opposite joist, again, uh, looking uh, quite symmetric between the two. So I've still got quite a lot of work to do on this project. Before I fail this specimen, which is happening hopefully in the next two weeks or so, I am going to also be doing some dynamic testing on the specimen because uh, the research to date into the dynamic behaviour of a timber concrete composite floor is quite lacking. Um, I will then be loading it to failure, so what I will be hoping to do there is to engage the plastic behaviour of these connectors and to look at the moment response in comparison to that which I've seen in this uh, low load elastic phase. Following that, I will be conducting some FE analysis which will inform the design of a second specimen. I'm 
uh, planning on doing two types of analysis. One is the full uh, plastic analysis using the abacus, and also is one is a more simplified model using lime beam elements, which is more designer friendly and can be used as a quick mock-up of um, models to, to test their applicability. The, the real driver behind this work is that the, um, the Euro codes will be updated in 2020 to 2022 and will include a new chapter on timber concrete composites. So the more work that is done on them now will feed in to this new revision and hopefully make their use more wide scale and prolific in the years to come. Uh, currently, the draft of that Euro code does not include anything to do with hardwood timber that I'm using, the steel mesh plate, or multi-joist uh, ability of load transfer. So hopefully that will all feed in, in the future as well. Thank you.